This is what most people thought of as a Western movie in the late 1940s. A simple story with a true blue hero, a black-hearted villain, and plenty of action. Even in the more mature Westerns by filmmakers like John Ford, there was a nobility to the heroes. And by the early 50s, most outdoor pictures, even the B-movies, were being shot in color. Consider then how unusual High Noon must have seemed in 1952. A stark black and white film with no picture postcard scenery. No action until the final moments. And a hero who wasn't afraid to admit he was afraid. High Noon went against so many conventions of the Western film that it actually angered some people. But this little, modest, low-budget film went on to win four Academy Awards and earn a reputation as one of the greatest of all American films. Hello, I'm Leonard Maltin, and I'm going to try to explain how High Noon came to be and why it's come to be thought of as a classic. A man alone, driven by his conscience to do what he must do. I could be discussing a Shakespearean drama, but in fact, I'm describing High Noon, a morality play that just happens to be a Western. There is no setting more universal in terms of storytelling than the Old West. Screenwriter Carl Foreman understood that when he conceived his story about a lawman who refuses to desert his town or his responsibility. Foreman's idea proved to be similar to a story that had appeared in Collier's Magazine in 1947. So for protection, producer Stanley Kramer purchased the rights. The final screenplay bore little resemblance to the story, except for the theme of the town marshal named Doan, who decides to face the four men who are coming to kill him. As Foreman's screenplay neared completion, the writer began to see his story as a parable for what was happening all around him, as colleagues in Hollywood were being deserted by their so-called friends. High Noon was made in the midst of the congressional investigations into the so-called red menace in Hollywood. Communist sympathizers, both real and imagined, were being hounded and exposed. And believe it or not, some people found this film un-American. The fact that the screenwriter, Carl Foreman, had been an unfriendly witness before the House Un-American Activities Committee didn't help. High Noon's producer, Stanley Kramer, remembers what it was like when the movie opened. We were picketed by every kind of group in the world, from the Ku Klux Klan to the All-American Activities Committee, uh, or whatever they called it. Uh, I think that uh, you stand for what you are. The picture is there. Is it moral? Yes. The marshal leaves the town because the town did not stand behind him against the people who entered. So it's moral. Is it American? I think so. It's a part of the Old West. Uh, is, it, is it something that you can truthfully back with your feelings, your emotions, your morals? I did, and I believe in it. Kramer didn't see High Noon as a political picture. Neither did the man he chose to direct the film. Viennese-born Fred Zinnemann had graduated from short subjects and grade B movies to top drawer feature films in the late 1940s. I had a three picture contract with Stanley Kramer's company. Uh, the, uh, the other pictures uh, were the men and a member of the wedding. And I was offered high noon and naturally I jumped at it because the script was excellent. There was a first draft script by Carl Foreman with the help of Kramer, which was first class. So I said yes, by all means. Some people said, how can a Viennese uh, director do a Western? Well, it wasn't all that difficult, really, with people like Cooper and a few, few others. Zinnemann was always attracted to stories about people facing a crisis of conscience. But like the visual storyteller he is, when he first thought about High Noon, he latched onto one potent image. I uh, saw so those trucks, uh, the railroad trucks, uh, that static shot where nothing moves. Uh, became very important to me. Not to show anything specific about the threat and see the heavies strutting around or anything. Zinnemann's background in low budget movie making came in handy on High Noon because this film was made for $730,000, a low figure for a major league movie even in the early 50s. The film was shot in just 28 days and the markings in the director's shooting script show the kind of detail he tried to inject into the picture in spite of its grueling production pace. Zinnemann didn't want to miss any nuances in Carl Foreman's script, 
from showing Marshal Will Kane's reluctance to retire his badge after the wedding, to adding realistic details that might add to the credibility of the story. Zinnemann's main visual collaborator was cinematographer Floyd Crosby. Together, they decided to avoid the pretty look most people associated with Westerns. This film would have no beautiful cloud-filled skies. Instead, it would look stark, arid, real, as if it were a documentary or a newsreel. The late Floyd Crosby's son, rock star David Crosby, remembers his father's work on High Noon with pride. He was very proud of it. He, he really loved it. You know, not that he would have told you that, but he was very proud of it, and he was very proud of working with Fred. He, he loved Fred Zinnemann. He had been friends with Fred Zinnemann since Fred came to America. He, he had befriended him early on when Fred was still learning English, and, uh, and uh, they were very good friends. And uh, so it was a tremendous opportunity, you know, for him to work with the best people and do, you know, uh, uh, what he felt was a really quality piece of work, and he was just, a, he, I know he was very happy about it. But all that skill behind the camera would have been for naught if the audience didn't connect with the movie on an emotional level. That meant casting the right actors in every part, beginning with the star, the man that most people at that time regarded as the quintessential American, Gary Cooper. The tall man from Montana had no formal training as an actor, but that didn't stop him from becoming one of the greatest stars in movie history and one of the most persuasive screen actors of all time. He loomed large on screen and off, as his High Noon co-star Lloyd Bridges recalls. I, I loved the man uh, before I saw him, and uh, I think I loved him even more after I, after I talked with Coop, because he, uh, he was such a down-to-earth, simple, no, no uh, airs of any kind. He was, he was what you saw on that screen. More than one director has said that in person, Cooper's performances seemed dull, almost invisible until they saw them on the screen. Okay, and let's get out of business. You want me to stick, you put the word in for me like I said. Sure, I want you to stick, but I'm not buying it. It's gotta be up to you. Uh, he made it so, so easy. Matter of fact, most of the time I was working with him, I didn't feel he was on camera, you know. We had our first scene, I thought, my God, I, uh, is, is this it? Is that going to be a print? It was a print, all right, and he was magnificent up there. Yeah. Grace Kelly was virtually unknown when she was chosen to play Cooper's bride in the film. She'd only been in one other picture, in a small role, when Stanley Kramer went to see her in an off-Broadway play. I met her and signed her when I met her, or determined to. And uh, that was it. There was no great discovery or anything. I don't know why Grace Kelly didn't achieve under our banner what she achieved later. She became a, a vital, a tremendous, active star. In our film, she was known as the young lady who came through very well opposite Cooper, period. Director Zinnemann agreed that she had the right look for the part, but he worried that people might question the age difference between her and Cooper. No one did. Equally unknown to American moviegoers at that time was Mexican actress Katie Jurado. But like Kelly, she made a strong impression in this film and established herself overnight. The cast was fleshed out with veteran character actors like Otto Kruger as the opportunistic judge and Oscar winner Thomas Mitchell as the level-headed mayor. The film was also a showcase for young character players like Harry Morgan in one of his slimiest parts and Robert Wilkie, who was in the process of establishing himself as a potent screen villain. Notes in Fred Zinnemann's copy of the script indicate some of the casting possibilities that were considered. For the part of Frank Miller's brother that went to young Sheb Woolley, such other up-and-comers as Hugh O'Brien, Peter Graves, and Fess Parker were considered. And for the part of Mart Howe, Lon Chaney won out over other actors because, apparently, the director was struck by his flat voice. Just the note he wanted for a world-weary retired marshal. People got to talk themselves into law and order before they do anything about it. Maybe because down deep they don't care. They just don't care. Still, the one piece of casting that made the picture work was having Gary Cooper in the lead. In a late 50s television interview, Dave Garraway asked Cooper why he made so many Western films. I like Westerns because the good ones are real. You feel real when you're making them, and uh, well, you don't feel actorish. 
the Western picture tells stories of the pioneer period. Uh, the pioneers uh, braved the elements, and we are brought close to the pioneer people by seeing the Western picture, and uh, we realize that our country was and is full of people who believe in America. To create High Noon on a tight shooting schedule, director Zinnemann used a technique that's common nowadays, the drawing of storyboards to plot out every key shot in the film, including staging and camera movements. Although some scenes were scheduled to be shot on location in Sonora, California, which still had a stretch of straight railroad track running alongside it, most of the picture was set to be shot in Burbank on a studio back lot known as the Columbia Ranch. Zinnemann, his art director Rudolf Sternad, and his cameraman Floyd Crosby planned their moves meticulously to avoid wasted time and effort and to build the tension they needed to make the story work. For Zinnemann, there were three basic elements that made the picture. The first element was the threat, which was, which was shown by the, by the railroad tracks that lead across the horizon. And you never see the evil, but you know it's going to come from there. Number two, against that static shot, there, was, there were the shots of a man running around town asking for help, which is not about to get. And number three, to dramatize that time is dripping away minute by minute. The, uh, the, you had the clocks, which were in the script, and which are shot in such a way that as the tension progressed, the clocks became bigger and bigger, and the pendulums moved more and more slowly. And at high noon, it all came to a stop. So the clocks were an integral part from the beginning. Before I even came on the film, it was already in the script. The use of clocks is one of the most interesting aspects of High Noon, because unlike most movies, the story unfolds in just about the length of time it takes to watch. Now, on occasion, Zinnemann manipulates time, but the emotions we feel are as real as the tension felt by the characters as that clock ticks away the minutes toward High Noon. There's also no denying that the film is superbly edited by Elmo Williams and Harry Gerstead. In spite of meticulous planning, nothing ever goes exactly as planned when a movie is made. The script called for a brutal fight between Marshal Will Kane and his hot-headed deputy. Gary Cooper was reluctant to shoot the scene because he was having back trouble at the time. But he was finally persuaded to do it. My son Bo was about six years old at the time. And uh, he'd heard about this fight, and of course wanted to see it. So there was a, a hayloft up above where we were going to fight. So before we started the rehearsal, I, I snuck him up there and, uh, with his mother. And, and uh, the scene ends with Cooper dousing with, with his big pail of water. And that was just too much for, for Bo. He burst out laughing, ruined the take, and we had to, had to do it all over again. But to show what a great guy Coop was the next day, he. Uh, he had us join him for dinner. He was a sweet man. The director got his shot, and the actor saved his relationship with the star. But on another occasion, the film almost lost both its director and its cameraman. We needed a shot of the train approaching and stopping right in front of the camera. And uh, to get the right angle, we were lying f absolutely flat between the two rails uh, with the camera down on the ground and uh, the train was on a straight line about a mile away and uh, I gave the signal to start and on it came and it looked beautiful and then he let out some white smoke and that looked great then he looked let out some black smoke which looked even better but what what we didn't know was it was a signal that these brakes were failing so uh, we didn't know, so we kept on shooting and coming closer and closer with the black smoke. And I don't know, uh, some people when they are, when it's really life or death, everything slows down. It's a very curious psychological thing. But suddenly I saw it almost in slow motion. Uh, the cameraman grabbing the camera like that and then 
put, trying to pull it out of the way, and then a hook on a tripod hooked on the rail, and the camera fell down, and the train went whomp, very fast, right across, and left. And then I looked, and I saw the cameraman standing and looking down at it, and the camera was smashed. But the, ma the magazine was intact, and the shot is in the picture, the black smoke. With no loss of life or film, production continued, and within a month, shooting was complete. The film then retired to an editing room, where first Zinneman, then Kramer, tried to shape and perfect the story. In the editing process, an entire subplot was dropped. In this deleted scene, actor Jim Brown plays one of Kane's deputies, who's bringing a prisoner, played by stuntman John Deheim, back to Hadleyville. Kramer and his director now felt that these scenes, shot for insurance, lessened rather than heightened the intended suspense. A comic relief scene involving town drunk Jack Elam was also abandoned. Meanwhile, Stanley Kramer was in the process of starting a new company and going to work for legendary Columbia Pictures boss, Harry Cohn. Cohn expressed interest in seeing Kramer's unfinished High Noon, but Kramer put him off. He didn't think Cohn would like it, but one weekend, Cohn simply borrowed the print without Kramer's knowledge. Well, I went in Monday morning, stormed into his office where he sat surrounded by the Oscars, past replicas of all the Oscars. I said, Harry, that stinks. How dare you take a film which isn't a Columbia film as a United Artists film and take it and run it without my permission. He said, oh, come on, kiddo, don't make a big fuss. Listen to the kid, he said to somebody in the office. He said, what difference does it make? So I ran it. It's a piece of junk anyhow. Well, it was high noon. And he made a mistake, a big one. Now, in fairness to Harry Cohn, the print that he saw of High Noon was missing one crucial element, music. You don't have to be an expert to know how much music can add to a movie. But in this case, the music was so unusual, so revolutionary, in fact, for its time, that it added a whole dimension to the picture. Here's what I mean. Most movies of the 1950s opened with a fanfare, a big orchestra. Here's what you heard at the beginning of High Noon. It was the versatile film composer, Dmitry Tiomkin, who wrote this song and devised this presentation, as spare and low-key as the film itself. Ned Washington's lyrics turned the story of the film into a ballad, which presaged the trend of title songs in the 50s and 60s, but more importantly, added resonance to the film. The man who sang the song on the soundtrack of High Noon had been a cowboy star on screen and was a top recording star in the Western field. His name was Tex Ritter. When my father was asked what his highlight was of his career, he would have to say that it was the night of the Academy Awards when he sang the song, Dmitry Tiomkin, Ned Washington's song, Do Not Forsake Me, Oh My Darling, when he sang it for the Academy. And then, of course, that night it won Best Song. I'm real proud that in, you know, uh, in some way it's, it's filtered down to my family and then my kids, you know, will always watch this film. For all its success, High Noon had a curious aftermath for several of its key participants. Screenwriter and associate producer Carl Foreman had fled from Hollywood and was living in exile in England by the time the film was finished. And others suffered, too, during this terrible period of blacklisting. I thought after I did High Noon that I, my uh, future would be uh, pretty rosy. But uh, uh, anyone who was sort of uh, liberal in those days or uh, wanting to do anything about improving humanity uh, kind of suffered. It was a terrible period, uh, and I was I was a part of a uh, an organization called the Actors Lab, and uh, there apparently were quite a few communists in that organization. So I suppose that was one of the reasons why I I was put on the list. Didn't work for several years. My dad had a real tough time because of it for a long time, and he was. I think one of the best cinematographers that you know that came out of you know early filmmaking, you know, and and had a long career that could have, where he was denied access to the tools, you know, that he would have loved, you know, for a long period of time. I think it was shameful. Uh, evil 
uh, was uh, very strong in those days. High Noon received accolades galore when it was new, including four Academy Awards. Two for Dimitri Tiomkin, one that he shared with Ned Washington, one for film editors Elmo Williams and Harry Gerstad, and one for Gary Cooper, his only Oscar. But the film's story is so timeless, so great, that it continues to impress people who discover it for the first time today. The reason I did it was not only because it was a good story, but it said something about human nature, which, which apparently never changes, in that there is a man who is in desperate trouble and is asking for help, and nobody is there to help him, everybody having very, very good personal reasons of his own, which is what happens every day, and has never changed. And you can see it time after time after time. And this is what I think makes it a timely movie.